thanks, Dave, for the invitation. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in and, and uh, coming to see my talk today. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here at McGill. And today, I want to give you an introduction to um, dynamic. what is a dynamic transmission electron microscope and what I hope to do with it in the coming years. Um, in short, in a sentence, it's basically an electron microscope that allows you to take snapshot images with a sub microsecond time resolution, which is much faster than a normal TEM. Let's see, how do I change slides? Okay, here we go. At INRS, this is actually one of, of two ultra-fast electron microscopes that we have. Um, the uh, other one is called uh, a ultra-fast electron microscope, and this has the capability of actually doing uh, femtosecond time-resolved uh, measurements. And that's headed by Professor Isar Njotsiever in the Institute. Um, the difference with the DTEM is that we're covering further, longer timescales, going into the nanoseconds and microseconds with the DTEM, and really studying irreversible transformations. And I'll get into a little bit more on that uh, in a few minutes. In the Institute, we also have a dual beam FIB SEM for further materials characterization and sample preparation. And I want to acknowledge really um, the, the funding which made this uh, institute uh, possible, it's, it's, it's new. So uh, it's installed just uh, a few years ago and uh, this was made possible by a CFI grant. And uh, also there's members of the RQMP who contributed to this CFI grant and I wanna thank them for their hard work and realizing this uh, allowed me to be here today to talk to all of you. Um, the microscope itself is, is more than just, uh, you know, a camera that can take really fast pictures. It also has the capability of uh, a lot more sort of materials characterization measurements. Uh, it's, it's based on a JL 2100 um, so thermionic um, microscope. Uh, so the electrons uh, accelerating Voltage is at 200 kV. Um, the, the GIF, um, there's also GIF, uh, which is an electron or a Gitan image filter, which is kind of an electron spectrometer uh, attached to the, to the column, which allows us to do a number of other uh, sort of chemical analyses of samples. So you can do electron energy loss spectroscopy or EELS, as well as FTEM imaging for those who aren't familiar with that, and FTEM, some FTEM imaging is displayed here in the slide, uh, showing you can do elemental mapping at a nano, nanometer uh, scale. And as well, we have a bunch of uh, sample holders to do in situ measurements, uh, heating, as well as cooling, and tilting, and rocking, and tomography. So you can do all sorts of really unique um, experiments with this, with this microscope. Uh, I'm interested in using this microscope in order to really study materials that are intriguing for addressing some of our, you know, energy challenges in the world. Uh, we need to find better materials that have a lower cost per kilowatt hour to, you know, increase the usability of, of, of solar, uh, solar energy, as well as better battery material, materials with a higher energy density and new materials for optoelectronics to realize new sort of devices. So I'm on the hunt for, for new materials with, with better properties in order to um, be able to realize these emerging technologies. And specifically, I'm very interested in metastable and polymorphic materials uh, to, because just by tuning the structure of these sorts of materials, you can uh, lead to dramatic changes in, in, the, in the performance and property. And I put the textbook example here. You know, everybody sees this in, in Physics 101 or Materials 101, where on the left we have amorphous carbon, and on the right we have uh, diamond. And it's, it's all just carbon, right? This is still just carbon, but just how the atoms are arranged in space completely leads to complete opposites in properties. Amorphous carbon, is a conductor, diamond is an insulator. Amorphous carbon is very ductile. It's used in your, your tires. Uh, and uh, diamond, of course, is one of the hardest materials that exists. 
So this just goes to show the sort of tunability and parameters just by uh, changing atomic structure, which is very intriguing for me. And I also want to point out that these are actually both metastable phases of carbon. Neither of these are actually a thermodynamic uh, ground state. The ground state at standard temperature and pressure is, is graphite, actually. So metastable doesn't mean unstable. Metastable is still very useful and it has uh, very you know, interesting capabilities. I kind of inspired by the work going on uh, with the folks involved in the materials project who have, who have shown that using computational material science that our, our sort of universe of materials phases is much more vast than what we've actually uh, synthesized in the lab so far. Um, on, the, on this plot here, we have in the red sort of the um, hypothetical polymorphs of, of a number of different compounds, zinc oxide, iron oxide, titanium dioxide, vanadate, uh, and molybdenate. So we can see is that the number of computer generated stable phases of these uh, compounds is uh, at least an order of magnitude larger than the number of observed polymorphs that people have uh, studied in, in the lab. And so this begs the question, is it that uh, we just aren't clever enough, we haven't figured it out, or is it that maybe some of these aren't attainable? In other words, that uh, how, what is, what is limiting the, the synthesis pathway in order to be able to, to end up at, at, these, at these endpoints. So um, in order to understand that, we have to understand a lot more about the kinetic, kinetics of the synthesis process. And uh, being able to synthesize a metastable phase, usually what you need for it to be is at least thermodynamically stable at some point throughout the synthesis process. So sort of a crystallization, picture diagram is shown here on the top. Um, we have the uh, free energy as a function of crystallite size. And for the green metastable phase versus the stable blue phase, and sort of starting from a super saturated solution, you can follow the dotted uh, arrow uh, on the energy landscape that this sort of synthesis might uh, traverse. Um, and you can see that the first one actually to synthesize or to crystallize is the metastable phase because there's a lower surface free energy. And then eventually, if you let the reaction progress long enough, you can build up a large enough driving force to convert the metastable phase into the stable or into another phase uh, and then leads to the growth. But if you were to just look at the beginning, the, the solution and look at the end, you would say, oh, well, we had a super saturated solution and then we had the stable phase that comes out. And so we have to look at the dynamics in order to really understand. And you could be able to um, stop the reaction and get a, a completely different um, material phase in between. But in order to know that, we have to be able to follow these reactions. And people, I mean, this is in situ measurements. This is what people doing in situ spectroscopy, uh, crystallography. People are hot on the trail of this. Um, uh, and as an example here, I show uh, you know, in situ X-ray diffraction of uh, manganese dioxide. And uh, it's a beautiful study uh, where they show from solution of what actually first comes out is sort of a layered structure, but it, they're not really clear. It's, it's it, the, the information that they were able to obtain at these early stages wasn't really enough to exactly know what the structure of this layered manganese dioxide structure is. They call it delta double prime. As it progresses, it transforms into a gamma phase. Um, and then eventually the, the beta phase is formed some 60 minutes later. Um, but this study also sort of shows the limitations of in situ measurements right now. Uh, one is you can see the time resolution. You know, we're able to follow things regularly in the seconds to minutes time scale. And the other limitation is the detection limit. In order for this to give enough signal, we have to have the crystallites or the phase be large enough or plentiful enough to be detected. So this just calls, and this is really the problem that I'm trying to address, 
it calls for um, brighter and faster characterization techniques in order to understand the early stages of materials synthesis um, reactions. And I have a lot of experience in my scientific career developing uh, new sort of characterization techniques and pushing the boundaries of the sensitivity. Uh, in my PhD uh, between Georgia Tech and the University of Trento, I combined powder X-ray diffraction line profile analysis along with electron microscopy and molecular dynamic simulations in order to try and be able to characterize the structure of platinum nanoparticle uh, catalysts. So not only being able to tell their size from the diffraction pattern, but also their shape and facets, which is important for electrochemistry. Uh, I went on to do my postdoc with uh, Henry Chapman at DAISY, and they're um, really turning up the intensity of the X-ray source. So working with X-ray free electron lasers in order to do single shot sort of uh, crystallography diffraction measurements of uh, proteins. But also I took this uh, as my own initiative to push this in the direction of inorganic structure determination and applying this to also synchrotrons. So you can do this approach of uh, streaming crystals through a very intense X-ray beam and taking rapid X-ray diffraction patterns and then piecing all the information together. And we can actually solve the structure of inorganic compounds as well, um, which might be radiation sensitive. Um, the, uh, also, I applied this rich database of, of information, also studied diffuse uh, intensity uh, and used that for structure determination, which is kind of shown in this colorful X, which is the diffraction pattern from the little uh, lattices uh, shown in the corners of that picture. Uh, I then joined uh, Professor Andrea Cavalleri's group for a few years, where I applied the sort of uh, coherent diffractive imaging techniques I learned with uh, Henry's, in Henry's group to study ultrafast materials transformations um, and specifically induced by mid-infrared light and studying the sort of cascade of uh, events happening when you excite uh, a heterostructure, a, a nicolate heterostructure, and you see this wash of, uh, you know, charge order melting and then disruption of the magnetic uh, order and then a lattice order. So studying correlated electronic materials and applying some of these techniques to, to really push the, the time resolution of our understanding of these processes. And now, uh, since the past year and a half, I've been working with the DTEM to, you know, take what I've learned in studying materials transformations and imaging and try and push the limits of what we can do with electron microscopy. And so um, kind of giving you an overview of, of the DTEM, it's, uh, it works actually based on a photo emission principle in order to get snapshot images. And you can send in not only one sort of laser pulse uh, into the column to generate uh, electron bunches, but actually a, a train of pulses to capture a movie of, of uh, irreversible transformation. Um, so this typical experiment goes where you have some sort of excitation in, indicated here by a, a laser pulse of your sample, which is sort of at this plane um, in the middle of the column. And then we get a, a train of electron bunches, and then we uh, time the arrival of the electron bunches relative to the um, laser pulse and are able to actually form an image uh, of the excited region as a function of time. Now, I already to give you a little bit of numbers. So this can achieve resolutions in the tens of nanoseconds to tens of, of nanometers. Yes, please. I'll get into that. This, I'm going to be describing what is really limiting the, the resolution here. But it, in short, it's an electron-electron interaction. Um, so what can you see with this? 
this is some images of an amorphous to crystalline phase transformation of a phase change alloy, it's germanium tellurium alloy. This is actually the material that is inside of your DVD or your CDs. And this is exactly how you write data to a CD or a DVD. The laser impinges on the film. It changes the phase from amorphous to crystalline. And if it's one phase, it has a certain reflectivity versus a different reflectivity for the other phase. And so there's your one and zero. There's your bit, basically. That's how you write data to a CD. And uh, understanding this crystallization process is also obviously interesting for you know, data storage, how small you can make the bit, but uh, also how fast you can write, right? So this is, um, you can see that um, this region that is, is excited and heat is injected into the system, which then triggers the, the phase transformation and the eventual growth. You can see that you don't only get the size, but you actually have structure, right? There's, there's um, darkness, there's some contrast you can see, and that's actually due to the, to the strain field, which is produced as this thing is rapidly crystallizing. So you get a lot of information by looking from at these sort of images. Also with the DTEM, since it's really a, a single shot imaging technique, you can really look at chaotic processes where slight changes uh, result in completely different sort of uh, mechanisms for crystallization and, and resulting microstructures. So this is just two different um, shots uh, at different, slightly different laser energies, pulse energies. And of course, it's in a TEM, so you can also do some, uh, some diffraction. Somebody raise their hand. Yes. Do you yes, have a question uh, out there? Go ahead. Yes, just a short question. Uh, at what temperature is the, the substrate? Uh, I mean, there, there's a pulse to heat, but uh, other than that, it's at room temperature or? Yes, so the question was what temperature was the substrate? And yes, it's, it's, at, a, it's at room temperature in these studies. Okay, thanks. But that can also be controlled by the sample holder that you use. So you can design other experiments to control the temperature as well. So, uh, I mean, full disclosure, I didn't invent any of this. This is developed in, in Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and it eventually turned into a spin-off company called IDES, um, the guys who put together all the technology in order to enable this, uh, which has been recently acquired by JAIL. And uh, that's, we purchased a, a system from, from IDES and JAIL, uh, one of the first systems uh, at INRS, uh, which includes all of these technological advances. And I'll get into more details here to tell you why and how this all works. Um, but first I wanted to appreciate and go through sort of uh, a thought experiment of really how many electrons you need in order to form an image. And this is useful because this gives you some rule of thumb, rules of thumb in the design of this sort of a microscope and what you, you know, why, why it's designed in, in the way that it is. So uh, does anybody have any guesses? How many electrons do you need to form an image? Ballpark number. Price is right. I mean, you can bet $1 if you want. I mean, one, one electron. What? A billion. A billion. Uh, close. Yes. We have a ringer. We have a, we have a ringer in the audience. So the answer, yeah, the answer is 10 to the 8 electrons. And I'll show you how you can kind of reason that out, some basic back of the envelope calculation. Um, I like to think of it, instead of how many electrons do I need to form an image, how many electrons do I need to detect information about my object? Because that's effectively what you're doing. You can think about this in an informational uh, standpoint, where the information is encoded into the electron beam by scattering. And so the quantities that you need to consider is of course the incident electrons. And then you have a certain scattering probability. And since I'm forming basic sort of bright field imaging images, then the, we're looking at the elastic scattering uh, cross section. And then you also have your detection efficiency. And the number of electrons that you detect is just the product of, of the incident times these other probabilities. 
the number of electrons that you detect that have reacted with or scattered off of your sample, I should say. So you can solve for Ni. And if you do that and you say that in a certain region of your image, you need at least one electron, at least. I need to have some signal. Um, so if you use these numbers and put in reasonable numbers for a little bit of gold and uh, standard uh, detection efficiency for electron cameras, you get for a, a given pixel or a given domain, uh, voxel, if you want, of your sample, you need to have around 150 electrons in that area incident in order to detect one electron on your detector. And now if we actually form an image, we have say a thousand by a thousand just to give round numbers. This is 10 to the six little regions where we have to detect an electron. Now we form a number on the order of 10 to the eight electrons per image. So that's the number, keep, keep that in mind. That's the number that's important for the rest of this, of this talk. Okay, we need 10 to the eight. Um, why don't we just use an electron microscope? Um, and so electron, normal electron microscopes uh, operate on thermionic emission. And this is a principle of, you have a, a metal coil or a metal filament and you run a current through it. And the, 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 the filament is the sort of the gold bit here and you run a current through this, which heats up the metal or the material. And then at a certain temperature, you actually are boiling off electrons into the vacuum. And then they, those, can be, those can be accelerated uh, towards an anode up to uh, 200, 300 kV. Uh, this works, you have to overcome the work function of the material. And so you're actually, the material is, is at an operating temperature around 1,700 1, Kelvin. Uh, just below the melting temperature. And the, with this, you can achieve probe currents in the range. Uh, so actually current on the sample in the range of, of a nanoamp, which turns into six times 10 to the nine electrons per second. Um, so if you solve for T, given this current, you need to integrate for you know, tens of milliseconds in order to form an image. And so this is really what limits the time resolution of in situ electron microscopy. That's why we have to go to a different source in order to be able to see faster dynamics than a few milliseconds. Yes, please. What limits the probe current? What limits the probe current? So um, the probe current is limited. Well, there's a few things. First of all, in this, in a normal electron microscope, you throw away 99% of your electrons. So you're cutting off uh, uh, you know, two orders of magnitude of your electrons. There's also just the, uh, you, if you want more electrons, you have to pass more current and eventually you reach the melting point of the material. And so you, you, you hover at this saturation regime and you want a certain lifetime of your material. So this is just sort of the sweet spot that people, you can push it, um, but this is where normal TEMs work. All right. Um, instead of thermionic emission, what you can use is photo, photo emission, photo electron emission. And here, this is a completely different process where we have a, a material um, with an energy um, distribution denoted here. And we come in with uh, light, which is above the work function in order to eject a uh, photoelectron. And then we collect these photoelectrons and, and use them for what we want. Um, some typical work functions are shown here. And you can see that with a neodymium YAG laser, the fourth harmonic gets you above all of these typical cathode materials. So that's a good, it, it fits, right? We can use already some cathode materials that are common in, in the in the field and uh, a neodymium YAG laser, which is also quite standard and we were converted to fourth harmonic. The, th the thing is, is that the quantum efficiency of this process is actually quite low. I mean, you need 10 to the six photons in order to get one electron out, but that's okay because we have a lot of photons because if you calculate how many uh, photons or what sort of pulse energy you need 
in order to get uh, you know, 10 to the eight electrons out, you come out to a few microjoules of fourth harmonic. So that's, that's achievable with sort of off the shelf laser uh, systems. And the bonus, of course, is that the electron pulse duration is directly linked to the light pulse duration. So you can have really short electron bursts uh, um, bunches that you can use to probe your material. Now there's different strategies of how to do this, right? And this kind of is the essence of the difference between the two microscopes that we have at, at, uh, at INRS. So one strategy is to actually use um, a very few, a very low um, pulse energy and just get a few electrons per, per pulse but then accumulate over a lot of, of repetitive exposures. And this allows you to um, achieve a higher spatial resolution and a higher temp temporal resolutions because you don't have to fight against as many electron-electron uh, interactions. Uh, and most of the literature, if you see ultra-fast electron microscopy, they're, they're talking about this approach of the stroboscopic imaging uh, then, but the DTEM comes from a different tack where we just want all of our electrons in one, in one burst and try and take a picture with that. And so um, what this means is that uh, while you're able to do single shot imaging and study irreversible dynamics, you're limited in the um, temporal and spatial resolution of the instrument. And to answer your previous question, Really, what's limiting this is just electron-electron interaction. When you try and squeeze so many electrons into one space, they repel one another. And that leads to a lot of different um, problems with trying to you know, get this get the photo emission to work and to be able to form an image. First of all, you have a, de a decreased photo emission efficiency. And this is the, the Langmuir effect, where you sort of have the electrons, which were in the beginning of the pulse, which were first emitted, are kind of not accelerated yet, and they're hanging around near the surface, and they're repelling the electrons that are trying to escape. Um, and then you also have just divergence. You can think of an electron cloud expanding as it propagates down the column. That leads to, you know, sort of uh, defocusing of, of your electron beam. You also have actual electron-electron scattering after the, they've interacted with the sample. And so this leads to loss of information. So whatever information you had about the sample uh, at that place in space due to electron-electron scattering is, is, can be scrambled. Also, um, again, since your you know, electrons are pushing against one another, it increases the pulse duration that you can achieve, and uh, it leads to the energy distribution broadening, which decreases again the um, sort of resolution. The, you have an increased chromatic aberration in your image when you try and look at it. So again, to overcome these things, a bunch of um, advances have been uh, made and sort of mitigate these, these issues. And I'll go through uh, a few of them just to kind of give you a flavor of, of how to uh, approach this. Um, first one I want to talk about is the laser that you have or that we have in order to even get the, um, the electron bunch train. And this is a very unique laser. Uh, it's very, you have to make it so that it's very tunable, the, the pulse duration. So if you want to say, have, uh, you know, two, two images separated by a microsecond, and then you realize that your dynamics are happening faster, you want your, actually, you want your images to be separated by a few hundred nanoseconds, or even up to tens of nanoseconds. That tunability has to be built into the sort of uh, design of the laser, and that's capable with the laser that we have. And uh, it starts off, actually, with, from a CW laser, a fiber laser, and then you cut out a, um, a pulse um, train with varying amplitude uh, and pulse profile in the nano, nanosecond regime 
with an electro optic modulator. Then this is fed into a series of amplifiers. And you go from you know, pulses that have a few nanojoules up to 100 uh, millijoules. So this is you know, six, seven orders magnitude increase in, in uh, pulse energy uh, through a series of, of bulk amplifiers. And that's really um, impressive. And then this sort of fundamental, this is neodymium YAG, so uh, 1064. So then in order to get the UV, you have to frequency double and then frequency double again uh, into 266. And eventually what you get in the end is a few millijoules of, of UV, which, which, are, which are sent to the, to the DTEM. But I think that this laser system is more than just uh, sort of gener good for generating UV into the DTEM. And uh, I think it could be very useful also to study a lot of unique laser processing um, of materials directions. And so if anyone has any interest in that, feel free to talk to me uh, in the future. Um, once you generate your electron bunch, I didn't, I don't, I don't have time to talk about the photocathode, but there's a whole seminar about photocathodes and, and why we use tantalum disks. Um, we can maybe discuss if you have some questions, but I want to move on to talking about the, the C0 lens. So in the condenser lens region of the microscope, we have an extra called C0 lens, which sits above the normal uh, lens stack. So this is the sort of optics, the condenser lens optics for a normal TEM. And you have um, the gun and then accelerating up to 200 keV. And then it goes into through some apertures and through a series of lenses in order to make a nice um, tight beam and control the, the spot size and, and spot intensity. Um, the first iteration of the DTEM actually was to just put in a mirror and open up these apertures a little bit, but they found that this actually leads to too many imaging aberrations by opening up these, um, these, these apertures. And so now with the C0 lens, the idea is to collect as many electrons and put them into um, narrower apertures and to try and reduce the uh, aberrations, but still retain a very high uh, beam current. So this C0 lens, with this sort of uh, configuration, you can actually get um, 100 times more electrons um, down the column onto your sample than what you would without it. So again, normal probe current is, is uh, around one nanoamp, and we're measuring at the peak in thermionic emission at the peak, um, we're getting probe currents in the hundreds of, of nanoamps. So um, this is a really bright, bright beam, blinding, frankly. And so um, with this, but there's trade-off. As you increase the number of electrons, you actually are also increasing the, the source size. So this leads to a decrease in the beam coherency and a decrease in the resolution. These two images are um, the electron beam that we have with a low C0 excitation versus with the peak the C0 excitation. And this scale bar is on the order of two micrometers. Now I wanted to not just show pictures from other people's papers, but I actually wanted to show our sort of timestamp of where we are and using this microscope um, in order to do, do some photo, um, some, you know, ultra-fast imaging. So this is very preliminary data. Please don't take this as the end-all, be-all capabilities of the microscope. I just wanted to share where we are and where we're going. Um, so we tuned the laser to produce a 50 nanosecond pulse, which you can see here. Uh, and then we directed that onto a tantalum disc cathode and put, aligned the column for to have C0 at its peak. Uh, excitation. And you can see the number of electrons that we get onto our camera as a function of uh, UV pulse energy. So we have ability to, to change the amount of UV um, intensity that we put. And 
you can see that we actually are saturating our uh, photo emission capabilities at the moment around 10 to the six electrons per pulse. Now this is short of the goal of 10 to the eight, obviously. So this is one thing that we're working on, but you can also see how the energy distribution of the electrons change as you go into the saturation. You can also see it saturating. Um, now the, the energy distribution, you can look at these numbers. This is actually quite high, tens of uh, EV, and that's typical for this sort of, uh, of, uh, of electron beam actually, but compared to a normal electron microscope, uh, this is 10 times larger. Normally you have a few EV uh, in the energy distribution. So keep that in mind. Uh, just wanted to point that out. And when we put in a sample of gold nanorods, uh, size around 50 nanometers, tried to image them. You can see the uh, thermionic. So we have three images taken with different sort of uh, exposures and, and different uh, conditions. So the first one is in thermionic mode and you can see nicely the clustering of all these nanoparticles. Uh, one little dot in this image is actually a nanoparticle. And then for a single shot with, with this, um, Configuration, we're able to see the large clusters. And, um, you know, if you're kind, you can say we're getting around 100 nanometer um, resolution at the moment. And as you increase the exposure, so you can accumulate more uh, images on the camera and increase the, the exposure and increase our, our, our contrast, we can see that we're also suffering from a little bit of, uh, of aberrations in, in the image. And so we're working on that. We're increasing our number of electrons as well as trying to decrease the imaging aberrations that we have to improve our spatial resolution to the goal of uh, 10 nanometers. So I talked a lot about how to just create and uh, image a single uh, shot, but really what we have is a, in a phase transformation is a sequence, you know, of events that we want to be able to capture in sort of a movie. And that's also capable with, this microscope is also capable of doing that using an electrostatic deflector system. So this is called, a, they call it a movie mode imaging, where uh, you can send a, a train of electron pulses at different time relative to your pump. And um, in between the electron pulses after this, has scattered off of your uh, sample or interacted with your sample, uh, you can deflect them into different regions of your camera. So different corners of your camera kind of shown schematically here with an electrostatic uh, field. And uh, this is again, sort of watching progression of a phase front transformation in, um, in a titanium boron thin film uh, to just show what you can see with that. Um, when we're playing with that right now and trying to commission that aspect of the instrument as well, uh, I want to shift gears and kind of start talking about what, um, what I'd like to develop further in, with this instrument and what we're working on and, and pushing forward with this instrument. So one idea is to build uh, and improve upon the this sort of movie mode, um, snapshot imaging, uh, and, and use compressed sensing in order to get a better time resolution as well as number of frames. And this is through, in the collaboration I have with Professor uh, Jinyang Liang at INRS, who's an expert in the compressed sensing phase retrieval uh, or uh, image retrieval algorithms. So again, the, the normal sort of operation to collect a series of images in the DTEM is, is kind of shown here, where you take um, all the images are kind of set next to one another on the, on the camera, and then you read out the camera uh, all at once, and then you are able to see the, the time evolution. In a compressed sensing experiment, it's sort of more like a streaking experiment, where the um, the, you use, instead of a train of electron pulses, you would use one long 
electron um, bunch, and then you'd streak it across the camera and you'd be able to recover the same uh, evolution um, without having to separate them on the, on the camera. So the goal is to do this in order to push below the nanosecond time uh, regime, push into picoseconds, and also increase the number of frames uh, to the tens or, or 50s. How this sort of experiment works, uh, it requires two um, instrumental developments in order to be able to work. One is the um, a, a, a mask, an encoding mask, actually, because uh, the compressed sensing approach actually requires the sparsity of the image, and you use this mask to enforce this um, sort of sparsity that the image reconstruction algorithm is solving for. So you kind of know the mask that you're using, and you're solving for what's in the holes in, in this mask. Um, as it's streaked across the detector. And so you, we were developing a mask as well as a electrostatic deflector system in order to, to do the streaking on, on the camera. And so the experiment would be conducted very much like a normal DTEM, except for instead of a, where did my mouse go? It's not there. Anyways, um, you collect the streaked image on your camera, and then you feed it into uh, image recovery algorithm. And after the fact, you're able to get back your, your scene, your, your scenes of the transformation. So this has been demonstrated uh, via simulations in the group of uh, Professor Liang. And what we're working on right now is developing the instrumentation. You can see in the simulations, the sort of the ground truth is uh, this is real, um, actually pin M um, microscopy data. So real kind of sort of signal to noise that you get in a, in a pin M experiment. And then the recovered image after it's all been sort of sheared, encode, encoded and sheared in, in a simulation and how you can recover the dynamics and the intensity variation in time. So we're working on, on developing that and developing the instrumentation to realize that um, project in the near future. And also, I think, I guess, old habits die hard. Uh, with um, I was inspired by the work of uh, during my postdoc with Professor Henry Chapman using X-ray free electron lasers, which are very intense X-ray beams. And actually, and they're so intense that they destroy the object that you or the particle that you put into the beam. Uh, and but what but they're actually so short that you can still obtain information in a diffraction pattern uh, or an image uh, of that object before it explodes. So this is termed diffraction before destruction. And it's sort of another just an idea I'm playing with right now. Uh, and I want to throw out for further discussion uh, is sort of with the DTEM, we're actually also approaching this limit of the having the temporal resolution to be able to outrun uh, sort of beam damage processes that happen in, in electron microscopes. Uh, so a single DTEM pulse, you know, when we have it focused down as we can, it will have on the order of 10 to 100 electrons per angstrom squared. And usually the dose limit for beam sensitive materials is in that same ballpark. So we're really able to run at the, the dose limit or maybe even go beyond for, in some cases. Um, so beam damage happens in many different mechanisms, but radiolysis is a, a very common one. And I kind of mapped out the, the time scale of radiolysis for, for molecules. This is showing water, but it's similar time scales for other molecules where first the electron beam excites the electron within the first um, attoseconds of, of the interaction. And then this creates a uh, sort of dissociation of the molecule or an excitation of the molecule. And this happens within 
you know, the first um, picoseconds and or femtoseconds. But what really causes the damage and the degradation in the signal is the with that free radical that's created, it, it starts to diffuse around inside and reduce other elements in the material. And that happens on a much slower time scale. So I think that with the, the DTEM, we should be able to do um, nanometer resolution imaging uh, of very beam sensitive materials before this radiolysis uh, mechanism takes hold and degrades the, the sample. But again, that's just a, at the stage of ideation. Um, I wanted to summarize and thank you all again for your attention. Um, again, a DTEM, we're talking about taking sub-microsecond snapshot imaging and uh, this giving us brand new insights uh, gearing up in, in the next few years into uh, material space transformations and studying metastable phases in particular. Uh, I'm very open to further collaborations to develop its capabilities if you have other ideas. And uh, right now we're in the commissioning phase, um, but in the future, this will be a user facility uh, that will be open to a call for experiments. Uh, and so stay tuned is all I wanna say. Thank you again. Thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering about, so you showed a plot of the saturation and the number of electrons and the energy of electrons based on pulse energy. And I was wondering uh, what's behind this. Yeah, uh, like with anything, you know, you, you can't put more UV on and get, and get more electrons off. So what we're still trying to do is um, there's a lot of knobs still to turn in order to get more electrons out. We can play with the UV spot size, we can um, play with the um, pulse profile. You can see that that pulse profile had a bit of a, a kink in it. So what you really more want is more of a flat top uh, in order to get a nice, uh, highly efficient photo emission process. Um, there's, there's a lot, there's so many different parameters that we're still exploring to try and... So I don't know the answer. I, I wish I did, then I would have turned that knob and I would have gotten more electrons, but... Um, we're, we're exploring that. It's, it's, it's very interesting um, physics about the photo emission process. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering, how do you calibrate the zero delay time between your excitation and your pulses? Yeah, very good question. Um, well, we're working on nanoseconds. So really, all you need is an oscilloscope. So uh, you, can, you can look at the, the sort of arrival time of the laser pulse and estimate the, the time it takes for the electrons to travel down the column. Um, so that we're not, uh, with femtoseconds, you have to do a lot more sophisticated uh, measurement. And there you actually rely on a pinm signal in order to time the arrival between the electron pulse and the laser pulse. But here, since we're in nanoseconds, we can just measure it with an oscilloscope and adjust the time delay. I had a question about the camera. Um, so I know there's a lot of uh, kind of advances in camera technology with direct electron detection and things like that. Is that something that you already have built into the DTAM or is it something that maybe could help in the future? What do you think? It would be very helpful in the future. Yeah, absolutely. No, we have a we have one of the more sensitive electron cameras, but it's not a single electron counting camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we could we could get another <laughs> order of magnitude, at least with an electron counting camera. Yeah, I think that would cascade down the line, right? Because then you need less electrons, yep. and then everything basically improves yep. with that one, yep. one electron. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good question. I actually had a question about movie mode uh, and where you place the the, the streaking electrons. Uh, so so the the electrodes that actually streak the electron beam to form the multiple images. Is it advantageous to have it closer to the sample? Or I noticed it was actually quite far down the column. Um, yeah, you don't have much choice to getting any closer to the sample because this is all your image forming lenses yeah. here right after the sample. It happens um, very, it, it actually happens, it, it's drawn 
here, but it actually happens closer to the to the view chamber, to the viewing chamber. Yeah. Um, because you 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 don't want to interfere with the actual image formation. Right. Yeah. And then at that time, uh, though, the everything has a chance to spread out a little bit. Um, yeah. Ideally, you want to move your detector as close as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any and none on the chat. So uh, please join me in thanking Ken once again. Uh,